Welcome back, Wargamers, as we continue our exploration of the Sons of Behemoth. Earlier this week, we met the faction of Gargans, and then took a look at the history of the realms through their eyes, and how they used these absurd myths and tales to explain the world and events around them. Now, as I mentioned, that these are oral traditions that were passed down by the matriarch of each Gargant tribe, and so many folks had questions about what... <clears throat> And so many folks had questions about what a tribe looks like, myself included. And so today, we're going to briefly touch on what a Sons of Behemoth tribe looks like, starting with the fact that the temperament of the Gargant in charge really sets the tone for the tribe and, and, and those kind of following him. Of course, those leaders generally coming in three variants. Those are the Kraken Eater Mega Gargants, the War Stompers, and the Gate Breakers. And today we're going to cover the Kraken Eaters, with the others following shortly after. And so let's back up a bit here, but what is a tribe like? Well, fun fact, the denizens of the immortal realms refer to a pack of gargants as a catastrophe of gargants, like a pack of dogs or a herd of cow. Gargants are far too simple to master words like catastrophe, so instead they call their tribes stomps. Anything to do with height, size, kicking, or stomping is of immense importance to the Sons of Behemoth. Given their size and stature, their feet interact with the mortal realms more than any other part of their body. And much like the simple-minded Iron Jaws, simple-minded at times, they take one thing they know, whether it's a fist or a foot or something like that, and they build a society around that. So for Iron Jaws, for example, they call their formations fists, and it's organized by how many fingers that particular orc has. Likewise, the stomp, or footprint, is used as the guide for building society within the Gargant culture. The most important part of the stomp, so to speak, is the heel. Whoever leads the tribe is the heel. And this is often uh, a mega gargant, but it's always the biggest, right? They're, they did kind of leave room for if a, a normal, you know, ale guzzler, guzzler gargant, whatever that old variant was called, you know, if there's just a bunch of them, the biggest one will be in charge, but generally speaking, it's a mega gargant. Now, some tribes are big enough to have multiple of these mega gargants, but there can only ever be one heel. Beneath him, are the next in line for power. These are his immediate rivals, and they could be um, like the heel's kids or competition or a mega gargant that just joined the group and, and wants to like, you know, fight to find his place within the tribe. He might be uh, in this kind of area known as under the heel. This tier can have several members as a part of the society, but this is generally the elite, the biggest, the baddest, but they are not quite the heel. Okay, so we have the heel, under the heel, and then the last part here are the foot slogas, and this makes up the bulk of any tribe of Gargants. And these are all the lesser ones. They could be of any size, uh, age, anything like that. It's just the common rabble, so to speak. Some of them uh, may come and go as they wish. You know, they maybe want to sack a city, and so they'll find a nearby tribe, say, hey, let's go fight this place, and uh, they'll join the tribe for temporarily, and then they'll kind of saunter off and do their own thing. And these are represented in our kind of diagram of the foot by the toes, hence the name. And there's a fantastic picture in the Battle Tome that puts this in context into how they see it. It's the outline of a normal foot, and the leader built into the heel and everything kind of extends outward from there. And in terms of structure, that's about it. I didn't see a ton of mention on how, you know, male and female Gargans act and do things differently, other than there is a matriarch and she is the story keeper of the tribe. And that's all about, I want to say, as far as tribes as a whole, before jumping into the specific types of them. And so today we're going to talk about the Taker tribes. A stomp, or tribe, that is led by a Kraken Eater Mega Gargant is known as a Taker Tribe. And these classifications are broadly related to things like a stage in a Gargant's life cycle or some outside influence that it's been forced to deal with. The term Kraken Eater refers to the oldest of the Gargants, long in the tooth, fiercely territorial. They often keep to themselves along isolated shores surrounded by cracky peaks. They survive on two main forms of hunting, 
primarily uh, is the overwhelming bounty of nature itself. They just literally wade into the water, they can hold their breaths for a long time, and they hunt and eat some of the ocean's most massive and fantastic creatures. The most famous of which are the Krakens of the Depths, hence their names. While few people ever see a Mega Gargant fighting with a Kraken, the dead carcasses of these huge squid-like creatures have washed up on shore with big old bites taken out of them, or their many tentacles are all tied up in knots. The second source of sustenance here are the near-endless caravans of sea vessels traveling the coasts of the realms. Whether it be, you know, a trading vessel crewed by scourge privateers, you know, for the for the forces of order, or a formidable warship under the command of a chaos lord, or, you know, a glorified pontoon boat full of happy fighting orcs, it's not uncommon for a ship to, you know, run aground on an unknown rock, only to find that the obstacle was a now in enraged Gargant. They often tear these ships apart piece by piece, eating any and all survivors they can find inside. It's by assailing these ships that the Kraken Eaters accrue their valuable treasures, often you know trinkets, weapons, but sometimes powerful arcane artifacts. While most Gargants would just as soon toss a magical item, the Kraken Eaters are older and can loosely be called wiser to an extent. They've seen what magic can do over their long lives, and while they don't dare to say that they understand it, of course it's super far out of their, you know, their wheelhouse, many will toy with magical weapons and trinkets until their secrets are unlocked, often accidentally. So when you put all this together, you get an extremely grumpy, large old man that has a closet full of treasures and hates when anyone gets on his lawn or in his fishing spot. And I gotta say, that's a heck of a Tinder profile and I respect it. The notion of tempers cooling with age isn't new to Age of Sigmar, but I like it here. Almost like, you know, the chieftain of a tribe gets old enough to claim a spot for his family and that specific area becomes their home, as opposed to the wandering gargants abroad. I think it's safe to say that there is more even temperament uh, might be why this form of Gargan is often hired by uh, the forces of order as a mercenary. If brave enough, a representative of a storm host or a city can walk up to one of these things, probably standing on a cliff to get eye level with them, and uh, you know inform him, hey, there's a chaos army that's about to sweep our lands, uh, or offer their tribe the right amount of food, hides, and alcohol, and there's a fine chance that a Kraken Eater will join them. I think part of it is because they are a little bit more tame, a little bit more chill. You know, they have this mutual respect, like the two kingdoms can understand the, the unspoken boundaries that we don't cross. We don't bother the Kraken Eater. But in that kind of mutual respect can be turned into an allyship if some third party, the chaos stuff, comes in on both their lands. Now, as far as options for a heel, again, the leader of the tribe, this seems to be by far the most stable and calm. They want to be left alone to think their painfully slow thoughts as they stare out across the ocean's horizon. Of course, however, the drama for the fate of the mortal realms around them makes this exceptionally difficult between intrusions on their land, the crowding of shores with shipping lanes and raiding parties, the horde of trophies they keep and everybody wants access to, there are plenty of reasons that a Kraken Eater tribe would go to war either on their own or in the service to a mutually benefiting neighbor. So why is all of this cool? Of course, you know, if this is my, my most important question, and if you're going to get this model, I think it's really, really important, is why is the Kraken Eater specifically so cool? Well, starting with the idea of the tribe, I love the brutal simplicity of destruction armies. It's always good for a chuckle, right? I see footprints all day, so that must be an important sign. I better build my culture off of it. As for the Kraken Eaters, I mentioned it earlier, but I really do like when GW has a few options for a kit and they make one, you know, kind of like the older, wiser archetype or variant. We see this with like the Frost and Fire Phoenix is another great example. And I don't know why. Part of it is because it reminds me that even though these creatures are, you know, fantastical and out there and crazy, they have a life cycle, right? Their temperaments, their boldness, their aggression and values change over the course of their lives just like ours do and in races that have some form of intelligence and, and by that i mean like you know gargants have tribes and, and family and that kind of stuff 
this can look really, really cool. How a stomp led by a Kraken Eater is going to look radically different from the other stomps that we'll cover later this week. And of course, lastly, I, I love him for the seaside look. I bet he smells just awesome. Just, just awesome. Just all the nastiness that's associated with general destruction armies on top of like seaweed and muck and that kind of stuff. I love it. There are some really cool stories I'm going to crack into here pretty soon regarding the Kraken Eater as well as the other variants. So catch me tomorrow. We're going to be talking about the War Stomper next. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the description down below. What do you think of this unit like as a story piece, right? Uh, as far as would you have one as, you know, a fictional neighbor to whatever, you know, Cities of Sigmar or Stormhost or whatever civilization you have built up for your army? Let me know in the comments down below. I'll catch you there. Thank you so much for watching and happy wargaming. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that video. It was made possible by the folks over here to the left. These are my top supporters over here on YouTube and on Patreon that keep this channel going. If you'd like to learn more about how to become a supporter and get some cool things in the process like exclusive pictures and interactions with me and get your questions answers here on the channel, go ahead and click any of the links down below or the join button on the community page over on YouTube. Regardless of your choice, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me with this video, and I look forward to seeing you in my next one. Happy Wargaming.